Okay, so lab test one, if you want to move so you can see the screen a little bit better, if you need to reorient yourself on the table, uh, feel free to do so. Lab test one will be Thursday then at 1145. And I'm going to go through these questions with you. And I'm going to start with the scientific method. Now, the scientific method has four steps. I'm just going to remind you those four steps of the scientific method. This is question number one, outline the steps of the scientific method. Step number one is observation. Step two is hypothesis. Step three is experiment. And step four is conclusion. Now, in this class, guys, I think you'll agree, we mostly concentrate our efforts on the number three step, experiments. And we do lots of experiments in this class. And during experiments, certain things happen that I want to talk to you about. Are they okay on the screen, the four steps of the scientific method? So I have, if given an experimental variable, be able to determine the experimental group control group, experimental variable, and data. So let me just give you a scenario, and this is a scenario we did in lecture. I put you in groups of two or three and told you that I observed that shrimp have different colors. Do you guys remember this? And I also told you that shrimp eat algae and that algae comes in different colors. So my hypothesis was that shrimp have different colors due to the pigments and the algae that they eat. So the idea was that if shrimp just ate green algae, they'd be green, or if shrimp just ate brown algae, they'd be brown. That was the hypothesis. So you may remember we designed an experiment, and we did it in a lab, and we came up with four tanks. Remember, all the tanks were exactly the same on size, water, lighting. Everything was the same. Pumps, everything was the same. And then we picked the same kind of shrimp to go in every tank. And I'm trying to remember, what did we put up, like 500 shrimp in a tank, something like that? Okay. And then, if you'll recall, one tank got green algae, one got red, one got brown, and one got shrimp chow, which is the commercial shrimp food. Okay, so everybody think about that. And during the experiment, our lab assistants, because we wouldn't possibly do it ourselves, our lab assistants would record the color of the shrimp, the mortality of the shrimp, the pH of the water, et cetera. They'd write stuff down during the experiment. Okay, so thinking of that scenario, what were my experimental groups? And I'll give you a clue. It's more than one tank were the experimental groups. Which tanks would be the experimental groups? The ones with the green algae, the brown algae, and the red algae. Is everybody okay on that? Okay, glance up here. What was the control group? The one, that had the, commercial. the one with the commercial shrimp food. And the reason it was the control group is because you knew what was going to happen there. Your control is always the one where you know what's going to happen. Okay, now let's stop on the idea of control for just a minute. I need two reasons why an experiment has to have a control validation and comparison. That's good. Okay, back to our experiment. What was my experimental variable? The diet. That's good. The different kinds of algae. So I would say diet, what we were feeding the shrimp, what the shrimp were fed, their diet was my experimental variable. That was what was different tank to tank to tank. Okay, and then lastly, what was the data or data for the experiment? That food was indeed the one that... No. You shut you down there. No. Dang, she's rude. <laughs> what was the data or data for the experiment? What is data? Thank you. It's what you wrote down during the experiment. Your data is what you collect during the experiment. So the color of the shrimp, what else? Mortality, what else? pH of the water, things like that. Whatever you write down during the experiment, that was the data. Now I shut Olga down because she was talking conclusion, I think. What's a conclusion? What the data tell you. 
what the data tell you. Okay, so data is just the information you collect during the experiment. A conclusion is what the data then tell you. And conclusions really can only be two things. The data support the hypothesis. That's one conclusion. What's the other conclusion? The data do not support the hypothesis. A conclusion, there's only two possibilities on conclusion. Either data support the hypothesis or data do not support the hypothesis. Okay, so look at my list of terms up here. Again, I'm going to give you a scenario, and you've got to figure out what each of these things are. And I think we had a little bit of this on our lecture exam last week, too. Is that correct? Okay, good. Okay, enough about the um, scientific method. Let's go to the metric system, the metric system. And this is actually our first day together. We worked on the metric system. And number one said, know the meaning of metric prefixes. And so I went ahead and wrote down some equations up here. If you don't remember these, I'm thinking you may have written them down in your lab manual. Check it out. Did you write anything down on page 21 in your lab manual? Let's see if, if this was handwritten in our lab manual. It is? Is that the right page? 21? Did you write anything down about metric measurement? Meh? Nah. Yeah? I don't know. <laughs> was another day? Yeah, so no handwritten notes? Yeah. What'd you write? Okay, so you wrote this one? Yes. Yes, there it is. Okay, so let me go back to this one. Okay, so I bet the reason we didn't write it down is because everybody knew it. Do you know that one meter is 100 centimeters? Yes? Yes? Okay, do you know one centimeter is 10 millimeters? Yes? So that one meter is 1,000 millimeters. Maybe we did this the very first day, and that's why it's not in our lab manual. Maybe we didn't have it by then. Okay, so this works really well if, you know, you want to measure this blue box. Centimeters works out okay, and you could convert it to millimeters or convert it to meters, whatever you need to do. But these measurements don't work at all well if you're using a microscope. So that's why we wrote these down, these. Um, that fancy U up there is micro. So I have that 1,000 micrometers, or micrometers, if you prefer, equals one millimeter. So when you start seeing units like micrometers, you know that we're, we've got magnification going on here. We're looking at something under a microscope. And you may recall this was working out just fine. Measuring things with micrometers is working out great. We can measure cells with micrometers and some big cell parts like the nucleus you can measure with a micrometer. But when the electron microscope was invented in the 1940s, <coughs> micrometers actually became too big to be useful because the electron microscopes went so high in magnification the micrometer was too big of a unit to be useful anymore. So that's where they came up with this next one, the NM. What does NM stand for? Nanometers. And so they took one micrometer and divided it into 1,000 equal nanometers, nanometers. And so I remember I asked you to figure out then how many nanometers it would take to make a millimeter, and we did 1,000 times 1,000. If you do that on the calculator, 1,000 times 1,000 is a million. But you don't have to do it on the calculator. How can you do it just without a calculator? You count the number of zeros, and there should be six, correct? So that's one million. My point is nanometers are measured for measuring really, really small things that we can't see with a microscope, like a virus. Or little cell parts like ribosomes are really, really small. We measure those with nanometers. So you're going to see NM on some of our measurements. 
What, what I need you to know, really, really small. NM means really, really small. Micro means small. Nano means really, really small. Okay? But okay on those conversions up there. Okay, so I think in our, if you look at our handout, step number two, everybody look at number two, and I want you guys to make those conversions for me. And you might need this information to make the conversion that's on the screen, or you might need that information. But you need all of that information to make that step number two or uh, question number two, complete the following conversion. So everybody work on those. When you finish, check your neighbor and see how they did. Do you already check your neighbor? You need to show a little concern for your fellow man here, okay? Check your neighbor. Okay, class two, 23 centimeters is how many millimeters? 230. 230, that's correct. 368 millimeters is how many micrometers? 368,000, 36800, 0, 0, that's correct. Our last one, six micrometers is how many nanometers? Six how many? 6,000. Convert micrometers to nanometers, you only multiply by 1,000. So these are my answers. Did you get my answers? So the zeros work for all of it? And the zeros tell you how many times to move it to. So if there's three zeros, you've got to move it three times. Okay. Okay, that was all number two. If you're following with me on the review sheet, that was number two. Let's go to number three. So I need a ruler out of your drawer, or maybe it's on your tabletop. I need a little plastic ruler. Could be a white plastic ruler or a clear plastic ruler, but if I find a ruler out of your drawer or tabletop. Everybody find one? Okay, yeah, you have to share with your partner. Okay, everybody look at the ruler, and you and your partner together decide how many centimeters are on that ruler. Do it with your partner. Come to a consensus. How many centimeters are on that ruler? Okay, what's the consensus? How many centimeters are on this ruler? 15. Okay, now with your lab partner, how many millimeters are on this ruler? How many millimeters? Talk to your lab partner. One million. <laughs> Okay, so it's 15 centimeters, how many millimeters? 150. But he's okay on that. So Ashley noticed that it was only a factor of 10, so we just added one zero. But it's okay on how to do that with a ruler? Super. Get that. Okay, question number four. I need the freezing point of water on the Celsius scale. Zero. zero. I need the boiling point of water on the Celsius scale, 100. You have to know that. And that does assume that we're at sea level. Look at that. 
Okay, number five is, a, is skills. And there's going to be a lot of questions on your ability to do skills. So let me give you some examples. I might give you this blue box and tell you to weigh it. So that means you're going to have to use the triple beam balance. I just want to caution you on one thing on the triple beam balance. Make sure the weights fall in the notches. The back two rails of the triple beam balance have notches. Make sure your weights fall in the notches to get an accurate reading. What would be your unit for weight? Grams. Grams. Okay, so you'll have to weigh things. Okay, you're going to have to maybe do the length of this box. And it's multiple choice, but I'm going to make you use centimeters because centimeters would be an appropriate unit for this. If I need to do the length of this room, look at this room, would centimeters be appropriate? No, no what would be appropriate? Meters. Meters would be appropriate. But for this box, centimeters would be appropriate. It's okay on that. I'm using a ruler. Okay. Uh, next is volume. You're going to have to do volume two ways. To do the volume of this box, what would you do? Length times width times height. Make sure you do it in centimeters so that your unit is centimeters cubed. Because length times width times height is centimeter times centimeter times centimeter. Okay? That's why you need a calculator for length times width times height. Okay, but look at this. This is forceps. We've used these before. Forceps. What if I want you to do the volume of these forceps? Use water, submerge it in a graduated cylinder. Quick question. Do you have to know how much water's in the graduated cylinder before you put in the forceps? I'm telling you, students crack me up all the time. They'll put the forceps down in the graduated cylinder and pour water on it. And then they'll look at it. I don't know. What's going on there? I don't know. So you got to have water in the graduated cylinder first. Do you have to know how much water? Okay, then you put in the forceps, and then what do you do? Look for the difference. So you got to do subtraction. Look for the difference. What would be your unit? Milliliters. Milliliters. Okay, that's what I mean by skills. You have to show that you can do lab skills on the test. But it's okay on that. That's number five. All right, number six. Know what a meniscus is and the proper way to view it. Well, first of all, what piece of equipment has a meniscus? Graduated, graduated cylinder. Great. So this is my simple drawing of a graduated cylinder. I want to remind you again, I did not take art, okay? <laughs> and I put a pink liquid in there. The meniscus is on a graduated cylinder. I like the way you're doing that, Gabe. He's doing this. And we learned why the water does that. Remember, water is adhesive to the glass, so it's sticking to the sides of the glass. So what do you view, like, to measure it? The bottom. you got to measure the bottom. Make sure you keep the graduate cylinder on the table. Make sure you get eye level to the meniscus. That means you have to bend down. Why shouldn't I just pick it up? It's not going to be level. So make sure you keep it on the tabletop when you're reading it. Here's why. It is a multiple choice question, but all the answers are close. So you've got to know what you're doing. Okay? Ms. Steinke wants to see you do it right. Okay? But it's okay on the meniscus question. Super. Let's go move ahead then. Chapter, uh, excuse me, lab two is on microscopy. Let's all move to page 14. Guys, I want to quickly remind you that there are uh, two different kinds of microscopes in this lab, and then there's two basic kinds of microscopes also. If I want to see blood cells, then a compound light microscope would give me an image like letter A. I don't own an electron microscope, sorry. But I also do own, or not me personally, that's the wrong word. Say you sent a college and own this stuff. So the compound of microscope is the one right there with the red handle. We also have used this scope before. This one's called a stereoscope. This would not be useful for looking at blood. How come? It's not powerful enough. Blood cells are too small. But if you caught a fly, 
and you want to see what the fly look like, this is your scope. Okay. Or um, you found a really bumpy plant out there, you know, had a nice texture on the leaves, and you want to see what that texture looked like in more detail, this is your scope. This scope shows surfaces. The contact light microscope shows internal details. Because that's why we have two different scopes, because they do two different things. This one's great for surfaces. That one's good for details. This one's called the stereoscope. Stereoscope. The other one's called the compound light microscope. Both the stereoscope and the compound light microscope use light. Thus, the power cord. You've got to turn it off. So they're very useful. A student asked me how much those scopes cost. You guys have, have an idea how much those scopes cost? Fourteen hundred dollars. I heard buy one get one free. <laughs> okay, so you're okay on what you would use each scope for? Okay, great. All right, then the second part uh, is what's the difference between a light microscope and an electron microscope? Well, obviously the source of energy. Light microscopes use light. Electron microscopes use electrons. Which one has higher magnifications? Electrons. And the reason you can go higher magnification is because electrons don't scatter. Light scatters. What does that mean, light scatters? Because all different directions. Yeah, you can just look up and see that light scatters. The rays bounce around, but electron beams don't do that. They stay straight. So you get better images, higher magnifications. It's basically the difference you need to know between light microscopes and electron microscopes. Okay, if I wanted to see something really, really small, like a virus, what kind of microscope would you recommend? An electron microscope. If it's really, really small. How would you know it's really, really small? Well, because you'd be measuring it with nanometers. Remember, NM means really, really small, right? So anytime you see pictures where NM is in the legend, that picture came from an electron microscope. Even when you see micrometers as a unit, lots of those came from my uh, electron microscopes too. Okay, we're good on number two. All right, number three. Um, using the stereoscope, you know how to use a stereoscope, also known as a dissecting scope, and what can you view with it? So you guys know how to use it. You focus with the black knob, and it's over here on this table if you want to glance. You change the magnification with the white knob, and you change the light with the buttons down at the bottom. It's a pretty simple scope. And we already talked about that it's like a fancy magnifying glass. If you want to see the surface of something in more detail, the stereoscope is your scope. Okay, I put two stars on number four because many questions on your test will come from number four. Page 18 and 19 are where we went over the parts of the compound light microscope and their functions. Again, two stars on that one because you're going to have many questions, so make sure you spend some time reviewing the parts and the functions of the compound light microscope. Now, our compound light microscope had three objectives. Would you turn to page 21 and review the names of the three objectives? Scanning, low power, page 21, scanning, low power, high power. We don't have oil on that scope. I have some questions for you. If you're on scanning, which objectives, I'm sorry, that's wrong. If you're on scanning, which adjustments can you use to focus? Here's your choices. Coarse, fine, or both? 
both. Okay. If you're on 10x, which is low power, which adjustments can you use? Both. If you're on high power, which is 40x, which adjustments can you use? Fine. Only fine. Only fine. I have more questions. Which of those three objectives, same choices, has the largest field of view? Scanning. And I think we actually measured it with a ruler, didn't we? Would it come out like five millimeters? Yeah. And then I th I'm just doing this off memory. Then low power was two millimeters and high power was a half, a point five, a half of a millimeter. Yeah. So does everybody agree with me? The objective with the, the largest field of view is scanning. Okay, which one, you got the three, same three choices, scanning, low, or high. Which one should you always start with? Scanning. scanning. Okay, good. Okay, second part of number five. Be able to calculate total magnification. You have to be able to calculate total magnification. We did that on table 2.3 on page 21. What's the basic equation for calculating total magnification? Okay, I'll ask you a different way. If you had to tell your lab partner how to calculate total magnification, what would you tell her? Multiply. Ocular times objective. Everybody check it out. Isn't that what we're doing in that table? We're multiplying ocular times objective. Yes? Okay, you have to know that. Total magnification is equal to ocular times objective. Here's my opinion. I'm not going to memorize that table. I'm going to memorize ocular times objective. Because on the test, I can look to see what the ocular magnification is, and I can look to see what the objective magnification is, and I can multiply them together. There's no reason to memorize them. They're, the numbers are on the microscope. How do you spot magnification numbers on a microscope? What do you look for? Like if you saw a 20 there, how would you know it was the magnification? What would be after the 20? An X. Because there's tons of numbers on a microscope, but only the numbers with X's after them are the magnifications. So you look for the number with the X on the ocular, then you look for the number with the X on the objective, and then you would multiply them. But okay with that? Okay, great. And again, that was page 21. If you want a reference page for total magnification, that's page 21. Now, guys, would you back up to page 20 now in your lab manual to the term inversion? What does inversion mean? Upside down and backwards. So check this out. I want to make the letter E right here. Everybody check out my letter E. Do you see it? Okay, how would I draw the letter E if it went through inversion? <coughs> Up, upside down and backwards. So this is what it would look like under the microscope. This is with your regular eye. Here, I'll draw a little eye right there. That's an eye. Oh, here's the eyelashes. And this is with the microscope. I'm not even going to try and draw that. So it's upside down and backwards. And then did you also notice I made the letter E under the microscope bigger? Because what do microscopes do? That's their whole purpose is to magnify, right? So everybody's okay on inversion means upside down and backwards. Okay. If you move a slide to the left, which way would the letter E move? If you made the slide go forward, which way would the letter E go? backwards. So movement is opposite using the compound light microscope. That's all on page 20. Page 20.
But I count exercise two microscopy. Leave anybody behind. Everybody's okay. Okay, we're going to go to exercise three now. And if you would, would you go to page four zero forty? I'm thinking there's a table there. You're going to have to know that table. We had to know it before for a quiz, and then we still have to know it for the test. Um, I'm going to make a real s stop for just a second and tell you about um, the way that quiz is going to play into your grade. Do you remember taking that quiz? Yes. Okay. So the test that you're going to take on Thursday, the most you can make on it is a 90. A 90. So we're at, what happened to the other 10 points, Ms. Steinke? The other 10 points are from your quiz and from your unknown. Remember you did a quiz for me one day? And on another day, I gave you a little vial with liquid in it. Oh yeah. oh, yeah. And you had to figure out what was in the vial. Those two things are worth 10 points. So, yes, you can make a high grade. You can make 100 on the test. But the test is 90 points, and the quiz and the unknown are 10 points. Okay? And when I finish grading your lab test, I'll staple it all together as one grade. Okay? So just... And once you think I just chunked them in the trash, okay? They're part of your grade, but they're part of your lab test one grade. Okay, so back on page 40, I want to know what chemical do we use, and here we go through the list, what chemical do we use for protein? Biuret. And what would give you a positive color for protein? Purple. And what color is negative? Blue. Okay, good. So we use by your red, positive colors purple, negative colors blue. All right, let's move to starch. That's the next thing on our list. What do we use to test for starch? Iodine. What gives us a positive color? Any dark color. Could be black, navy blue, dark purple, chocolate brown. Let's go dark colors. Everybody okay on dark colors. Okay, and what would be negative? Amber. So everybody's good on that one. Okay, here's our last one. Sugar. It's the last part of this sentence. What do we use to test for sugar? And heat. Thank you. This is the one where you have to heat. Benedict's and heat. Now, in my opinion, there are multiple positive colors for sugar. What are they? Green, orange, red, yellow. Yeah. Uh, which one means just a little bit of sugar? Green. Which one means... Man, there's so much sugar. Orange, orange, red. That's good. Okay, what's the negative color for sugar? Blue. Okay, so you got to know that. Got to know that's page 40. Okay, lastly on page 40, question number one, how do you use brown paper to test for lipid? Well, everybody knows first you have to put the liquid on the brown paper and evaporate the liquid, and we use the microwave to do that. And then after that, you have to hold the brown paper up to the light. Now, what do you look for? Translucence. And if you see translucence, that's positive. No translucence, that's negative. Is everybody okay on that? It's just a quick review of page 40. Okay, great. Expect many questions on that. Okay, did that. Okay, next question. Have a, I'm sorry. What are the building blocks of carbohydrates? We're going to start with that one. And I'm going to give you a hint, in case you don't know. Page 28. Okay, turn to page 28. I need the building blocks of carbohydrates. Anybody? Simple sugar. Excuse me, simple sugar, or if you prefer monosaccharide, they're the same thing. Simple sugar is a monosaccharide, monosaccharide is a simple sugar. Either answer is complete or correct. The building blocks for carbohydrates are simple sugars. The building blocks for carbohydrates are monosaccharides. Same thing. It's okay on that one. Okay, next in the list, what are the building blocks of lipids? Page 34. In case you don't know, building blocks of lipids, page 34. 
fatty acids, how many do you need? Three, and what else? Glycerol. Glycerol and three fatty acids are the building blocks for lipids. Glycerol and three fatty acids. Bet you got this last one without even looking. Building blocks of proteins. Tell it again. Amino acids. Amino acids. Page 33 is a good reference page for the building blocks of proteins. Page 33, amino acids. Hey guys, just for fun, would you go to page 33, everybody together on page 33, top of the page. I'm on the second question of number two. How are monomers combined to produce polymers? Okay, well, the monomers for a protein are amino acids. How are amino acids put together to make big proteins? I'm asking you what kind of reaction do you do? Dehydration. Everybody check out what Francisco just said. Dehydration is how one amino acid joins with another amino acid to make something larger. Dehydration. Dehydration. It's the second part of question number two. How are the monomers combined to produce polymers? Dehydration. Okay, just stay on page 33 for this last part of number two. How are polymers broken down to produce monomers? Hydrolysis. That's good. Hydrolysis. It's the reverse. Hydrolysis. Well, that's nice. <laughs> Okay, everybody look over number two. Is everybody okay on number two? There was quite a bit there. Okay, number three, we are, guys, we are moving back to page 28 and 29, lay it out flat for number three. The question is, on number three, define monosaccharide, disaccharide, polysaccharide, give an example of each. Okay, well, monosaccharide, that's so easy. What's a monosaccharide? Simple sugar, and I need an example. Glucose. Glucose. I also mentioned up here fructose, because that's real common in your everyday diet. We use fructose a lot to substitute in for table sugar these days. It's cheaper. Because it's real high in fructose. Um, sugar in general is bad for you. Sugar makes you gain weight and leads to diabetes and obesity. So table sugar or fructose, which is corn syrup. So if they, if they take every corn syrup out of all the products, it's not really going to make it any better. Um, it's going to drive the price up. Okay, because Raising corn is cheaper than raising sugar cane. So it, it, what drove corn syrup to be as popular as it is, is economics, which you knew that. Money drives everything. Drives that car. Yes, it does. Okay, everybody okay on monosaccharide? Okay, super. Still on page 28, what's a disaccharide? Two simple sugars. Everybody okay, disaccharide would be two simple sugars because DI means two. I need an example of a disaccharide. Maltose. Mm -mm, that one's simple. Starts with an S. Sucrose. That's table sugar. And that, historically, that was our sugar. Sucrose. And that's what came from sugar cane and sugar beets. I mean, whole economies were built on that. Especially in the Caribbean. 
whole island co economies were based on that. So that's why their economies have cratered, okay, because we don't harvest much of that anymore. But go visit them anyway. They're beautiful, okay? All right. Last one, polysaccharide. What would that mean? Many sugars. Many sugars. Many sugars. And page 29 is a drawing of a polysaccharide that you and I like very much. A great example. What is it? Starch. What is starch made out of? What sugar? Glucose. So when you eat starch, you completely digest, breaking every... Look at that picture. You break every one of those bonds and absorb it into your blood. You eat starch, you're eating glucose. That's why people with diabetes have to watch their starch because it's seriously just sugar. You eat pasta, you're eating sugar. You eat bread, you're eating sugar. Okay, Corn, you're eating corn, you're eating sugar. Any of the grains, if you're eating any of the grains, you're eating sugar. Anything made from grain, you're eating sugar. Alcohol. Alcohol is made from grains. Why is everything about alcohol, alcohol today? I don't know. I don't know. Okay. But it's okay on polysaccharide. All right, I have a second example up here. Somebody mentioned it a minute ago, and it's the, sh uh, excuse me, the polysaccharide I'd like you to think of more often in your food choices, and that's cellulose. Now, your parents don't call it cellulose. What do they call it? Fiber. Fiber. And it's, a, it's structural. Can you digest cellulose? No. Give me two reasons why it should be in your diet. It moves food through the food tube, and it fills you up, so it helps with weight control. You eat foods high in cellulose, you're going to lose weight, or at least maintain your weight and not get bigger. Cellulose is good for you. Eat more cellulose. And again, people call it fiber. But it's okay on polysaccharide. All right, next question. Oh, this is a good one. What is the common energy storage form of glucose in plants? How do they store their glucose? Starch. The answer is starch. That's good. The answer is starch. Second part of number four. What structures of a plant cell store starch? It's just starch grains, guys. The answer is so easy, you don't want to pick it. Starch grains. Now, this is what botanists call them, ameloplasts, but this is what's going to be on your test, starch grains. If you've ever heard of ameloplasts, that's the same thing, starch grains. Starch grains what's going to be on your test. When we saw starch grains, we made a wet mount of what plant? Potato. That's when we saw the starch grains. Good job, Francisco. Okay, last question of uh, number four. What substance must be added to a potato to see starch grains? Iodine. Very good, iodine. Anybody have a question about number four? Number five, what is the common structural glucose polymer in plants? That's right, cellulose. Eric's right, cellulose. This one's not for energy storage. This one's for structure, structure. So plants, they're not making cellulose to keep your digestive tract regular. They don't care if you poop or not. Okay, plants are building cellulose to build something. What are they building it to build? What structure? Cell wall. Very good. Cell wall. So what cell part is composed of cellulose? The cell wall. Cell wall. Just side note, guys, eat lots of apples. Apples are real high in cellulose. And they're sweet. Uh, celery, real high in cellulose. Well, it's not so sweet. Celery would be good. The crunchier it is, the more cellulose it's going to have. You're really good for you. 
Okay, fresh vegetables, fruits and vegetables are better for you than cooked or steamed. Even putting it in a blender isn't as good as eating it raw. Okay, eating it raw is better for you. You use way more energy eating raw foods than stuff that's been blended. Okay, smoothies are nice, but the real thing is better. Just, that's not on your test. I'm just throwing that in there for free. Okay, question number six. What term is used to describe the bond between amino acids and a protein? Peptide bond. Excellent job. Peptide bond. And I just noted that's on page 33 if you needed a reference for question six. It's on page 33. Okay, now one day we were playing around with the emulsifier called bile. And I just want to show you on page 35 how bile works. Would you turn to page 35 with me? Remember bile, the emulsifier bile, has a hydrophilic end and a hydrophobic end. It's kind of cool. It's like a phospholipid, really. And if you mix bile with fat, it does two things. First, it breaks it into little bubbles, and then it coats it with polar hydrophilic areas, so that makes the fat dissolve well in water. So that's what an emulsifier does. It takes fat and breaks it into small pieces, and then those small pieces dissolve well in water. And that's why emulsifiers are often used as detergents or soaps. They help you get oil and grease off of things. Now, on the next page, page 36, please, we did two test tubes. I drew them up here. In one test tube, we put water and oil. And in the other test tube, we put bile and oil. And I told you then, you're going to have to know the difference. Now you can pick up the test tubes on the test, give them a little shake with your wrists. How are you going to be able to spot the one that's oil and water? Yeah, they're not going to mix well and the oil is going to keep going to the top. How are you going to be able to spot the one that's oil and bile? It'll be broken and the oil will break into little droplets. Are they okay on that? You'll have to do that. It's a skill you're going to have to do on the test Thursday. Okay. Okay, adipose tissue is on page 37. You know, adipose tissue is what most people call fat. But fat, in reality, is a chemical that adipose tissue storing. Adipose tissue stores fat. It's one of the functions of adipose tissue. Now, does anybody remember why my body stores its extra energy as fat instead of carbohydrate or protein? Wouldn't that be great is if you overate, your body stored the extra energy as protein. Then people who ate too much and didn't do anything would be so buff, okay? Big old muscles, okay? But that's not what we do. Does anybody know why we store our extra energy as fat instead of protein or carb? It, well, it's got to do with the calories, right? Yeah. Do y'all remember how many calories are in, a fat, in, in lipid and fat? Nine. What about protein? Only four. How about carb? Only four. See, you can store more energy per gram if you store it in fat. So it's actually more efficient per gram to store your energy as fat. That just really helps me understand why my body's doing that. It's nothing personal, okay? It's just more efficient to store my extra energy as fat. Okay, I need you to know three functions of adipose. I bet you wrote them down on page 37. I've already given you one function of adipose to store energy or store fat. What's another function? Insulation. What's another function? Cushioning. You know, three functions of adipose. Last question, where can you find adipose in your own body? Yeah. Well, some, some of us store it in other lo different locations. Like in men, they mostly store it abdominally. Women store it abdominally in our hips and our thighs. But it's under our skin in general, okay? It's under our skin. 
it's under your skin. It's primarily where you store your adipose is under your skin. It separates your skin from your muscle. It's a layer that separates your skin from your muscle. Everybody okay on that? Okay, that was exercise three, the chemical composition of cells. Is anybody anything repeated on that one? Super. Exercise four, moving ahead. Now, guys, go back to page 40 and 41 and lay it out flat. We made a couple sketches, the bottom of page 40, to compare prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. Can you recall prokaryotic? What does that mean? Before the nucleus. So would those cells have a nucleus? No. no. Eukaryotic, what does that mean? True nucleus. So would those cells have a nucleus? Yes. Okay. You have to be able to tell pro from you, karyotic, under the microscope. And here's my promise to you. If we made a wet mount, it's on your test. Every single wet mount we made is on your test. No other wet mounts are on your test. So I'm not going to just whip up something that you've never seen before and stick it on your test. So you should be able to look through the microscope and know if it's prokaryotic or eukaryotic, and I'll use cells that you have seen before. Okay, you also have to be able to tell if they're autotrophic or heterotrophic. How do you know? Mm. Animals would be heterotrophic. I heard the word green. Who said that? It's good. If you see green, for sure, if you see green, what do you got? Autotrophic. Okay, how about if you know it's a plant? It's got a cell wall. If you figured out it's a plant, would that be autotrophic or heterotrophic? Autotrophic. Okay, that means you just got to use your brain and think about it, okay? Okay, so you said that prokaryotic will not have a nucleus and eukaryotic will. Next part of question one. I want you to come up with four things all cells have in common. Four things. The plasma membrane. We were talking about that today, and I think that was one of our clicker questions. You all said all cells have a plasma membrane. But I want three more things. Nope. Prokaryotic cells don't have mitochondria. Nope. Nope. Ribosomes. All cells have ribosomes. Those are the little things that make proteins. The little organelles that make proteins. All cells have ribosomes. DNA. Good job, Lewis. DNA. All cells have DNA. Give me one more. RNA. RNA. All cells have RNA. So let me recap what you said. All cells have a plasma membrane, ribosomes, DNA, and RNA. Okay, question two. Be able to recognize structures and list functions of those structures of an animal cell. And I reminded you your cheek cells were animal cells. I love page 44. I just love it. I loved it so much I put it on your test last week. Things I love show up on tests. I don't know if you figured that out. Okay, so I need you to come up with two things that a typical animal cell would have and a typical plant cell would not. Lysosomes. Lysosomes. Uh, centrioles. Lysosomes and centrioles. If you're thinking, man, we did this already, it is true. We did it last week. Two, these are two things, I have them up on the screen, two things that the typical animal cell would have and the typical plant cell would not. Just comparing plants and animal cells. Okay, page 45. I'm loving that one too. Page 45, plant cell. And I want you to know three things a plant cell would have that an animal would not. So wall. Chloroplast, central vacuole. Good job. 
Those are the three things a plant cell would have, an animal cell would not. Again, that should seem familiar to you. Okay, before we leave the front of this sheet, I want to say it one more time. Every wet mount we made is on your test. So I just want to recap those wet mounts before we leave. Page 40, oscillatoria and the human cheek cell. And page 46, elodia, onion, and potato. So review your sketches and your labelings. If I took the time to label it, that means you have to know it. Okay, so make sure you review your sketches. If I took the time to write it up on the board, it's going to be on your test. I don't just do it because it's fun. It is fun, but I do it also because it's on your test. We're going to the back. Now, guys, we today in lecture did these words, diffusion, osmosis, and active transport. I remember this. i got three words up on the screen right now, diffusion, osmosis, active transport. Everybody listen to my description. Tell me which one I'm talking about. This is the diffusion of water through a semi-permeable membrane. Osmosis. Everybody okay on that? Okay, this is the movement of particles from high concentration to lower concentration. That's diffusion. Okay, this is the movement of particles from low concentration to high concentration using energy, active transport. Okay, so you can defer to your lecture notes for these terms. We just had them just a few minutes ago when we were downstairs. Let's look at the second part of number one. You got those three words. In which of those three examples, which ones are passive? That means for free, don't cost you any energy. Diffusion. Osmosis and diffusion. Yeah, those are for free. They don't cost you anything. We call that passive transport. Doesn't cost you energy. Okay, in which of those three do the molecules move from low to high concentration? Active. Active. That's good. But okay, on number one. Okay, look at number two, and I want you to change one of the words in number two. It says, in which would diffusion be faster, dye in auger or dye in water? So just cross out the word auger and put the word jello above it, because I think you'll be able to think about it better if you think of the word jello. Mm -hmm. Thank you, New York. So, jello, as you know, is a semi solid and water is a liquid. Now, I already have the answer circled up here. What's the answer? Water. water. And so, earlier today, we were coming up with the things that affect the rate of diffusion, and density was one of them. And I think you'll agree, water is not as dense as jello. And so, a dye molecule would more easily move through water than it would jello. Correct? Okay. I want to think about diffusion for just a couple minutes on page 49. Last week you had um, a beaker. You made a beaker with your lab partner. And the beaker, I know you guys remember this, the beaker had iodine water in it. You put in so much iodine, it looked like iced tea. And then you and your lab partner made this little bag with, um, it was this tubing. You had to twist, 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 twist. You remember this? And I think you remember you put starch in there. And at the beginning of the experiment, the starch in the bag was white, and the iodine in the beaker, that was amber. Does everybody agree? Yes. And then we came back about an hour later. What color was the starch in about an hour? Purple. Purple. And how about the beaker? Still amber. So we said that somebody diffused and somebody did not. Who did diffuse? Make up your mind. Who did diffuse? Who moved? The iodine. 
iodine moved in. And what was your evidence that the iodine did move into the bag? Starch turned purple. Okay. Then we concluded that the starch did not move out of the bag. What was our evidence that the starch did not move out of the bag? The beaker stayed amber. And then at the very end, we had to come up with a reason why. Why is it the iodine was able to move, but the starch could not? Size. It was size. And even downstairs, you guys agree with me that small things diffuse better than large things. Size matters. Okay, small things diffuse better than large things. I just want to remind you about that and how you prove that with that experiment. Everybody's okay with that? Okay, great. Now, look at my uh, drawing up here, and just for fun, I want you to draw my drawing, but I'm going to change a few things up here. So, draw my drawing, and it'll be different than what we've done before. Okay, I got my beaker up here, and I got my bag. And in my beaker, I'm just going to leave it water, but in my bag, I'm going to put molasses in here. Have you guys ever heard of molasses? What is it? It's like this really thick sugary syrup stuff. Okay, now I want you to think about what would happen here if you let it set for an hour. Set, let it set for an hour. What's going to happen? Something's going to diffuse. I don't know. Sugar's pretty big. The water. Which way is the water going to go? In. So what's going to happen to that bag? What's well, going to swell. It's going to get nice and plump. And if you didn't tie that string tight, you're right, it's probably going to burst. You know, right here, here's the weak spots right here. Okay, so water's going to move in. Everybody agree with me? What kind of environment did you put this bag in? Good. Everybody hear what Charles said? He said hypotonic. How come? Because water is moving Water's moving in and the so bag is swelling. swelling. Okay, so make sure you have that in your notes. The way we have it drawn right here, this is hypotonic. Hypotonic. The concentration of solids is very low out here, so water's moving into the cell. Hypotonic. Okay, draw it again, and I want you to notice this time I'm going to change everything. Draw your beaker again. Draw your little baggie again. Kind of looks like a piece of candy, doesn't it? No? Okay. All right, so here I'm going to put molasses, and in the bag I'm going to put water. So I, I flipped it on you. I changed the position of everybody. So now this time water's in the bag and molasses is in the beaker. What's going to happen now? It's going to be hypertonic. So what's going to happen to the bag? It's going to shrink. So water's going to move out of the bag and the bag is going to shrivel. It's going to shrink. That's a hypertonic environment because the environment's so concentrated with solute. Hypertonic means lots and lots of solute. Just need it one more time remind you hypo means it's going to swell hyper means it's going to shrink what's iso mean stay the same if that wasn't on your review sheet i just wanted to kind of refresh your memory on those ideas do it there do it there okay Okay, number four, considering the function of the contractile vacuole and amoeba, what environment you predict it lives in? Well, I drew an amoeba. Let me tell you my abbreviations up here. First of all, an amoeba looks kind of like a splat. You guys ever seen paint splats? Every splat's different. Amoeba it always looks different. It's ever-changing in its shape. Amoebas have a plasma membrane on their outside. So this black line is the plasma membrane. I just wrote PM for plasma membrane. What do you think N stands for? So would this be pro or eukaryotic? It's eukaryotic. Okay. And just point out one more time, no cell wall. Okay. 
All right, the contractile vacuole is a water vacuole. And so what I have here in, in pink is just water molecules. And what the contractile vacuole does is collects them. It brings the water in here. And then the whole contractile vacuole moves to the edge and does exocytosis and spits the water out. What's exocytosis? It's where things leave the cell with vesicles. So literally, a contractile vacuole is a vesicle full of water, and then the vesicle moves to the edge of the cell and spits the water out. So would it be hypotonic? Hypotonic. Mm -hmm. So it's living in a hypotonic environment. That means that water, water is constantly coming in. So it's the job of the contractile vacuole to collect the water and spit it back out. What would happen to an amoeba if the contractile vacuole stopped working? It would blow up because it doesn't have a cell wall, so it'll burst. Okay, so yes, the answer to this question is hypotonic. It lives in a hypotonic environment. Hypotonic. Um, anything that lives in fresh water, like a lake, a pond, a river, a stream, that's hypotonic. They're living in a hypotonic environment. Anything that lives in salt water, mm -mm. iso. Salt water is isotonic, isotonic. There are a few species that can live in hypertonic water. They typically are bacteria. Not much can live in hypertonic water because you shrivel, and it's usually harmful even for most microbes. You don't like salty, salty water. Um, side note, life evolved in the oceans, and so that's why most cells are isotonic to ocean water. So they've got some kind of um, excretory organ that controls their water balance that works really well. Sure. Yeah, some sharks can do it. Um, so what? if you were just comparing function, the word we use for just comparing function is analogy and biology. An analogous organ to the contractile vacuole at us would be kidneys. And so whatever can move back and forth like that, it's got some amazing kidneys because they're controlling their water balance. Yeah. Okay, so everybody okay on question four. Okay, question five, potato strips. Okay, so this was back a few pages over, if you don't mind, page 53. Potato strips are on page 53. So we did some potato strips, and in one test tube, we put a potato strip in 100% water, no salt. It was distilled water. And when we pulled it out, I think it was test tube number one, it felt hard or rigid. What kind of environment did you have the potato strip in? Hypotonic. How come the potatoes didn't burst? Because the cell wall. Remember, a hypo should make things swell, but not plants. They swell, but they don't burst. But okay with that? Okay. The second test tube, you put in 10% salt water, really salty water. And when you pulled it out, it felt real bendy. We use the word flaccid. Bendy or flaccid. Limp or flaccid. What kind of environment would cause that? Hypertonic. Plants aren't going to like that at all. They're not going to function well like that. Now, guys, on the test, you will be able to pick up the potatoes and feel them. Make sure you can tell one that came from a hypotonic environment from one that came from a hypertonic environment. Here's another thing. On the test, you have to tell the difference through the microscope. And we did that on page 52. You may remember, we made a wet mount of red, I'm sorry, purple onion. And first we put it in just water, hypotonic. And then we took the water off and put on salt water hypertonic. Was there a difference? Okay, which one is the cell completely full? Hypotonic. Hypotonic. So that would be a turgid cell, have really high turgor pressure, great structure. And which one where it's a cytoplasm all pulled back away from the cell wall? Hypertonic. Hypertonic. 
There the cell would be flaccid, have very little structure. So you can see why a plant would like hypotonic over hypertonic. So let me recap that. You should be able to feel plants and know if it was hypo or hyper. You should be able to look through the microscope and know if it was hypo or hyper. You okay on that one? Tight, firm. That's good. Okay, number six, the crenation and hemolysis, we're going to omit that part of number six. But let me tell you what they're talking about. They're talking about page 51, page 51. They're talking about those red blood cells. I want you to know what is isotonic for red blood cells. What is isotonic for red blood cells? 0.9%. But it's okay on that. Okay, I want you to know what would happen if you put a red blood cell in a salty solution. It would shrivel. That's good. I need you to know what would happen if you put a red blood cell in distilled water. Swell and burst. But okay with that? Okay, number seven has to do with plants. How do I look up here at my screen? How do I know number seven has to do with plants? Turger pressure. Turger pressure. Anything else up here? Cell wall. Good job, New York. So cell wall only has to do with plants. So I'll never talk to you about turger pressure for animals because it's not an applicable term. What kind of environment would give a plant high turger pressure? Hypo. What kind of environment would give a plant low turgor pressure? Hyper. Are you okay with that? So really when you were feeling those potato strips the other day, you were feeling for turgor pressure. And like um, Stephen said, when it was real firm, he was feeling high turgor pressure. And it was bendy, he was feeling low turgor pressure. Are you okay on turgor pressure? Okay, question eight is so easy. Why would you predict that an animal cell but not a plant cell might burst when you place it in a hypotonic environment? It's the lack of a cell wall. Animals don't have a cell wall, so they're going to swell and pop. Okay, so count number eight. Okay, so lastly, guys, we have a little bit to do about... Um, pH in cells. This is all review. Um, I'm going to define this and you tell me which word I'm defining. And you get two choices. This is either acid, no you get three choices. You get acid, base, or buffer. Those are your choices. Acid, base, or buffer. This is a substance that accepts hydrogen ions. Please. Accepts them. That's a base. The substance that accepts hydrogen ions, that's a base. If you're accepting hydrogen ions, that's a base. You're a base. Okay, then this will be easy. How about a substance that gives away hydrogen ions? That's an acid. That's good. So I wrote those down for you. Acids give off hydrogen ions. Bases accept them. Hydrogen ion is H with a plus sign. Okay, so what's a buffer? It neutralizes pH changes. Yeah, they tend to neutralize pH changes. Buffers neutralize pH changes. Okay, what's the lowest end of a pH scale? How low can it go? Zero. What's the highest? What's neutral? What's below seven? What's above 7? Okay, so you got the pH scale. Okay, would you join me on page 55 to look at some data?
We did three test tubes at the top of page 55. Water, buffer, and cytoplasm. We took the pH of just the water, the buffer, and the cytoplasm. Then we added some acid, and we took the pH again. One of these test tubes, the pH drastically changed when we added acid. Which test tube was it? Water. Okay, so take a look at um, my graphs. I have two graphs, A and B. And the pH scale is over there, and uh, seven's at the top because that's neutral. I know pH actually goes to 14, but it wouldn't have been anything above that. Did it draw it on there? Zero's at the bottom. And then the x-axis is drops of acid. So this would be no drops of acid, like one, two, three, four, five drops of acid. Zero, one, two, three, four, five drops of acid. So everybody see that the water graph, which is the graph on the left, came straight down because water's not buffered. But check out this graph. This is the graph for test tube two, the buffer, test tube three, the cytoplasm. What's going on with that, that graph? It's staying constant. Does everybody see how it's resisting, resisting, resisting? Eventually it's going to be overcome and it will come down, but it resisted. And your data support that, correct? The buffers and cytoplasm resist the pH change. Yes? We don't count my graphs. <laughs> Did I tell you I like graphs? Just check it. Okay, our last question is, what's the function of an antacid? What do antacids do? They neutralize acid. They neutralize acids in your stomach. And I think we had a competition of antacids, yes? Who was our winner? You were. Alka-Seltzer, that's right. Alka-Seltzer, that's right. Okay, is there any question that I need to um, go over again? Any questions? Okay, so I have a couple of announcements.